another episode of Grandma's Room. I'm here with Joffrey, and today, we're gonna get fucking stinky with you. We're gonna go over the Battle of Sheld, Sheld, and what? Tra the abduction of Tra Travis Scott? Travis Walton. Travis Walton, my bad. From the Travis Scott concert. Yeah. Uh, whenever you pull up to the UFO, tell him that Travis Scott sent you. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he'll just watch as you die. Yeah. In the crowd. <laughs> Is that what happened? What? What happened at... The, I've never... I never, like, really found out what happened at the Travis Scott concert. I don't know. Someone got trampled or something, and was he, like, still just, like, watching him or something? I don't know. I can't... I've, if I'm being honest, like, this is the first time I'm remembering that. I'm not gonna tell tales out of school, because I don't know the story. Yeah. So, you wanna get into yours? You want me to get into mine? I wanna hear... I wanna hear about this abduction. Okay. This is a longer story than I usually do. Okay. I heard it... On the Joe Rogan podcast, like, over a year ago, he interviewed Travis Walton, and I re listened to it again last week, and I was like, fuck, I should do this for the podcast, because it's a weird story. Mm -hmm. So, Travis Walton abduction. Let me catch my breath from moving my chair. <laughs> the date was November 5th, 1975, and Travis Walton and six other men, Mike Rogers, Alan Dallas, John Goulet... Dwayne Smith, Kenneth Peterson, and Steve Pierce. They were working in the Apache Sitgroves, Sit, Sitgreaves National Forest on a tree trimming contract. They were like, I don't know if you call them lumberjacks, but like they were thinning yeah. out the forest. Liquidating. So, hmm? They were liquidating the forest. They're liquidating. So at 6 o'clock, the sun had just recently set, and it was finally time for the men to go home. So they all piled into their truck and planned on being home by 7.30. There's seven dudes that crammed into a truck. Seven, yeah, I think, yeah. All of them crammed into one truck, so they were like fucking like sardine in the back. Mm -hmm. So they were in the truck talking shit when a light caught Travis's eye through the trees because they were driving through the forest. It was about 100 yards away to their right. And at first he thought the light was just like the setting sun, but he was just like, wait, the sun set like half an hour ago. Like, what the fuck is that? He thought maybe it was like deer hunters or something. But he also noticed that the men on the right side of the truck also noticed it. And as they got closer, they started being like, hey, what's that light in the trees? I don't know if they're Italian. But it sounded like Sly. Maybe maybe he might have been there in spirit. Yeah. But the, like, it didn't look like a natural light or like something that, like a flashlight or anything. They said it was a very bright yellowish light. So Mike, who was driving, couldn't really see it. And he asked what they saw. And Dwayne said it looked like a crashed plane hanging in a tree. They're like, we need to go see if, like, someone's like there's survivors or anything if it's a plane crash. So they stopped the truck. They all got out to get a good look at it. And Alan yelled, my God, it's a flying saucer. And they saw a silent golden disc hovering about 20 feet off the ground. And they were all, like, silently staring at it in awe. He said, like, what they would do is they would cut the trees and they would make piles of them so that the Forest Service could come in and burn it once it was, like, wet out. And they said, I don't think this is where they were cutting it, but there was, like, some pile of brush or something. And this thing was just hovering over it. So, like, what the fuck is this thing? It's silent, like, it's just uh, unnatural. But obviously, in it's 75, there's been stories of UFOs and stuff already, so they're like, fuck, this is a UFO. Yeah. So they all felt a mixture of emotions, including, like, intense fear as they stared at the thing. It had an eerie yellow glow coming off of it. And Travis estimated that the disc had a diameter of about 15 to 20 feet and thought it had a thickness of about 8 to 10 feet. So it was, like, wide and not, like, super tall. Yeah. He said it looked like two pie pans stacked, like, on top of, like, a, yeah. dip, like, pretty much, a, like, a flying saucer, like, two saucers on top of each other. But he said it had a little dome sticking off the top. That's, like, the classic, like... Yeah, like, Rick and Morty looking. Yeah. He, he said it didn't... I don't think they saw... No, they definitely didn't see anything, like, standing in that dome or anything. Like, it was just motionless. He said the thing looked like it was made of metal panels. It looked extremely new. There was no entrance entrances. There was nothing sticking off of it. Didn't have any seams or anything. Like, it was welded together. No doors, no windows or anything. It was just pure metal. So, it was so, so still and silent that he said it looked dead. Like, I don't know if that gives you a better idea of what it looked like. It was just... Motionless. Uh, yeah, just sounds there. unnatural, obviously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, 
Travis felt that he needed to get close to it, so he started making his way towards it, and Mike whispered, what do you think you're doing? And the other men tried to, like, discourage him, like, they're, like, whispering, like, dude, come back here, like, don't get close to the thing. So, he said he got so close to it that he was bathed in the yellow light, and he was about six feet from being underneath it, and he could hear this very faint, like, mechanical pitches and, like, a humming, and he said he could hear, like, high and low pitches of sound coming out of it, but he, it was, like, really faint. So, suddenly, Mike yelled, Travis, get away from there! And as soon as he yelled, he said the craft started, like, moving, like, looked like it was wobbling. Like, it was, like, looked like it scared it, and it started, like, wobbling. And started making loud vibrating sounds. And he said it looked like a top. Like, if you spin a top, like, when it starts to slow down, it yeah. starts wobbling like That's that. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. So Travis startled. He ducked. He said he had to run forward towards the thing to get behind a log just to get some cover. So he got closer to it. And... He was hit in the face and chest with a blue-green ray of light that felt like a high-voltage high voltage electrocution. It made a popping and crackling sound as it shot him, and then to Travis, everything went black. So what the men saw was him limply being blown through the air about, like, 10 feet before he hit the ground. Like, this thing fucking shot him into the air. Yeah. <laughs> so Steve yelled, it got him, and they all freaked out and got in the truck, leaving as fast as they could. I, like, I, don't, I don't know why they wouldn't, but I also can't think of, like, what would I do if something like that yeah. happened? I don't know why they wouldn't go for him, but at the same time, it's like, you just saw a UFO fucking, like, shoot him through the air. Mm -hmm. So, Mike was yelling at the men, asking if the craft was following them as they were driving away. But they were silent and utter, sh utter shock, not being able to say anything. He was terrified, driving way faster than the road allowed. He jumped the truck, damaging it. Like, they were fucking flying through this shitty trail. Mm -hmm. Jumped the truck landed like it sounded like it fucking like exploded like it was so loud so he realized he needed to drive smarter so it wouldn't break down so they weren't stranded with that thing out there so then they stopped knowing that they weren't being followed they were terrified they talked about what happened like all confirming what they'd seen and they argued about whether or not to go back to get travis and they decided to build a fire so some of them could stay back and some could go try to rescue Travis. Like, they didn't want to just sit in the dark. Yeah. And they were about to light the... He said they were about to, like, put gas in the fire to light it. And they saw the headlights. So they were going about, they were gonna try to go to the lights to, like, flag someone down and be like, Hey, we need help, we need help. And they saw the disc above the trees. And they're like, oh, fuck, it's back. So then Mike turned around. Oh, I guess they started... Because they started driving towards the headlights. Okay. And Mike turned the truck around. He was like, this truck is going back. Anybody who doesn't want to come can get out right here and now and wait. We've been acting like a bunch of cowards. We're all scared. There's no denying that. But we got to do what we should have done in the first place. So they're like, they finally got some sense back. They're like, we need to go back and get Travis. Mm -hmm. He was like, if you don't want to come, you can stay here. But obviously nobody wanted to stay out without him. So they all went back. Yeah. So they went back right to where the ship was. Travis was nowhere to be found. So they searched the area calling for Travis, but they heard nothing. They saw no evidence of anything being there at all, like no burn marks from the electric, nothing like if the thing took off, they didn't see shit blown around everywhere. Mm -hmm. So then they left, realizing that they were going to have to tell the police what happened. Next thing we know, Travis woke up. He's in pain all over. Like he felt like he's fucking so dying. This is, this is Travis's story now. Yeah, we're going back to Travis. He woke up. His body felt like he was extremely weak. He was insanely thirsty. He felt like he was dying. He opened his eyes and he saw a light above him. And it looked like a metal ceiling. Like he was in a room. And at first he thought he was in a hospital. But then he was like, why the fuck is it so hot in here? Like hospitals aren't usually kept like hot Pretty and cool. stuffy. Yeah. So he realized he still had his work clothes on. And at first he said, he thought like, holy shit, like it must be a real emergency if like, like they need to operate on me fast if I still have my clothes on. And then... There was some device on his chest that he, like, he said it was, like, this panel going around the contour of his chest, and it felt like it was pushing down on his chest, like, it was kind of hard for him to breathe, and he, like, opened his eyes, and he started looking around, and he saw what he thought were doctors standing, like, a little bit farther away, and they had these orange, like, jumpsuits on, he was like, what the fuck, like, when did doctors start wearing orange jumpsuits? And then he realized they weren't humans, they were skinny beings with large heads and huge luminous brown eyes the size of quarters. 
He said they were the size of quarters, but then he said the eyes were bigger. So I don't know if he meant like the irises, because he said the irises were so big that. Yeah, that his... makes a lot more sense because like our eyes are like the size of quarters. Yeah, well, but he said the iris, like the colored part, was okay. so big that the pupil was covered partly by the eyelids. Like it was fucking huge. Like you could barely see any whites of the eyes. So he freaked out and he swung his arm into the two people that were standing to the right of him. And he said he pushed one into the other easily with the back of his arm. And he said it looked like they had no muscle on them. He said the creature was light and had fallen back easily. So it was like hitting a fucking rag doll pretty much. They looked because they're like skinny little things. Like he said they had like no muscle. They um, said they looked kind of infantile. Fucking needle boys. Fucking needle dicks. So he jumped off the bed staggering because he's still weak. Not taking his eyes off of them because he didn't want to like look away and have them like run at him or anything. Mm -hmm. So the device that was on his chest fell to the floor and he said it was like glowing green. So his body wasn't cooperating and the three of the things, the aliens or whatever, they started like walking towards him slowly with their arms out. And he, through primal fear <laughs> and strength, he said that like um, he grabbed for anything like off the table behind him he could find. And, oh wait, I just skipped a page. So he started reaching for a weapon and he found this like transparent tube type thing. He said he didn't know if it was like glass or plastic. And he said it was very light and he tried like breaking the tip off to make like a, like a sharp like knife or something. Like, you know, how people break a beer bottle. Yeah. He tried to do that, but it wouldn't break. Like he was slamming it off the table and nothing would, like it was extremely strong, like stronger than it should have been. So... He started swinging the tube at them, screaming, and they slowed down, but they still kept getting closer to him. He yelled, keep back, damn you, and then they stopped and just stared at him. And you notice now that they were a little under five feet tall, because right now he's getting a good look at them, because he's like yeah, trying to figure out what he's going to do. He said they had two arms, two legs, they were like basic humanoids. He said they were marshmallow, they had marshmallowy skin, like it was just like, it looked like weirdly soft and white. Yeah, like matte, almost. Yeah. Said their clothes were orange and suede like coveralls that seemed seamless. Like there was like no no zippers, no buttons or anything. You said they were wearing an orange jumpsuit? Yeah. I think it looks something maybe like that, just a little bit. At Elvis? Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had the orange coveralls, pinkish tan footwear, and they had very small feet. They had small hands, no fingernails. When like he saw when they reached out towards him, he was like, They have no fingernails. I was like, what the fuck? And he said they had bulging heads, small jaws, and had an underdeveloped appearance to their features that was almost infantile. Their narrow, small mouths and tiny noses. Their eyes had irises that were so big that the eyelids covered only, like, it covered some of the pupil. That's how big their eyes were, like I already said. They had no eyelashes or eyebrows. They were, like, completely hairless. They probably got lasered. So the whole time, he screamed at them saying not, um, oh, the whole time he screamed at them, they weren't saying anything to each other or or him. They were just, like, fucking, like, weirdly, like, silently coming towards him. So he was just about to lunge at them, and they all ran out of the room and turned right down the hallway, and he was left alone, and then he had an adrenaline dump. He was like, fuck, like, you ever get, like, a burst of adrenaline, yeah. and afterwards you, like, come down, and you're like, fuck. It, like, yeah. You feel kind of like weak. like a pre-workout or like that. Yeah, like a sugar rush. You, like, kind of crash. Yeah. So he searched for a better weapon. He found nothing. He said he found some devices that kind of looked like the, like tools you'd see in a hospital for like surgery and stuff, but none of that was good for a weapon. So now he's like, I need to get out of here. So he looked down the three foot wide hallway and he saw no signs of anybody. It was like a really thin hallway. So he started running down the hall and then he slowed down at a door looking for an exit. He found a domed room. He said it was about 10 feet tall with three more doors in that room. And the closer he got to one of the doors, the darker the room got. He said he'd get close to a door and it looked like the wall turned into space, like he was seeing out into space. But then when he backed up, it would turn back into a wall. He said like the closer it got, it looked like you're looking out a window, but when you got farther away, the room lit up again. So he found a chair in the middle of the room. It was just a room, a chair in the middle, three doors. So, the chair had controls on it. He set like a bunch of buttons and he started pressing buttons like crazy, trying to like open a door or something. Nothing happened. So then he sat in the chair. He said the chair was pretty small for like, it was made for like the beings that were in that room. So 
it had buttons and it had a lever on the arm. So you push the the lever forward and the stars and stars in the wall came into view and they're like moving and it was like disorienting him. So he let go and the stars stopped moving, but the room didn't light up again. So he moved out of the chair and then the walls went back to normal again. It was like just completely disorienting. It was yeah. weird. So he looked for controls around the doors and he had like, he couldn't find anything like buttons on the wall or anything trying to open the door. And he heard a faint noise behind him. So he whirled around quickly to see what it was, and there was a human standing in a doorway. He said he was about six feet tall, he was muscular, he had a skin-tight blue suit on, and he had a helmet like a bubble, like space helmet. Like the classic, like, sci-fi yeah, helmet. Like Sandy. Yeah, yeah, kind of like Sandy. So Travis ran up to him, asking him, like, a million questions at once. He said he was, like, babbling, but the guy, again, said nothing to him and just stared at him. This It sounds unnerving, like, they just yeah. don't say anything. So he said he firmly but gently took Travis by the arm and they started hurrying down this hallway. They went through a door into like a cubicle type room, kind of like an elevator, and they started in it for about two minutes. And then it opened up into an airlock type room filled with what looked like sunlight. He said it was like sunny in there. And when they walked out of the, I guess this door was them walking out of the craft into a bigger room. And he said the craft itself, once they were out of it, looked bigger than the one they saw in the woods. And on the other end of the huge room, he saw multiple other saucers sitting there. So they made their way to the hallway, another hallway, and they got into a room that had three other humans in it. Oh, and that big room that they were in, he said there was like a bunch of other saucers like parked there. And they were just balancing on the floor somehow, like there was nothing like supporting them. So they went into another room and it had three more humans in it. There was two men and a woman. They were all standing there and Travis said, would somebody please tell me where I am? What the hell is going on? What is this place? Again, they didn't say anything. And uh, one man put him on the, like, the, he like lifted him up on the table. And Travis started like trying to like get them off of him. Yeah. And then the three of them just pushed him down onto the table. And the lady that was there put an oxygen mask type thing on him. He said it looked like an oxygen mask. Oh, shit, my phone. He said it looked like an oxygen mask, but instead of being connected to anything, there was like a black, like golf ball sized ball on it. So I don't know if there was like chemicals or something in that. Yeah. But he said when the woman put the mask on him, he got like really weak and then went unconscious. So then he woke up. He was lying face down on a road in Hebrew, Arizona. He said he looked up and saw a light turn off on the craft, like it was floating there. He said he didn't know if it was a light turning off or like a door closing. And then it hovered there for a couple seconds and then just took off straight up into the sky. Totally silent. So it took off. It didn't make any noise. Like, it should be breaking the sound barrier with how fast it went. Yeah. And it, all it did was, like, make some wind. And so he, like, got up disoriented. He started just sprinting down the road in the middle of the desert. Like, if you would see that at night, you'd think it was just some crazy dude. Mm -hmm. He said he went, to, he got to the little town was like beating on this bit like door of a gas station or something trying to get someone to help him nobody was there there's no cars or anything like everything still seemed unnatural there's nobody no cars or anything so he went sprinting down the road farther he found a payphone and he called his i think his sister and his brother-in-law picked up and he was like told him where he's at and his brother thought it was like a prank like some like uh, like people knew it wasn't, I don't think it was, like, nationwide news at this point, but, like, they had to report it to the police, and they put, like, a missing person thing out. So he thought it was, like, someone fucking with him. And he was like, it's me, Travis. Like, I'm at this place. I need you to pick me up. And he was, like, still kind of, like, cautious. Like, I don't really believe you. But he was like, okay, we'll be there. So they went to pick him up, and he was laying in this phone booth just fucking waiting for him to come here. And he started talking to them about, like, he said they were awful. They had white skin, great big eyes, and like he was just like discombobulated, obviously. So let me find what he said. Wait, so where did he live? He was like, where did the abduction take place compared to where he ended up? I can't remember if it was New Mexico. It was New Mexico or Arizona. I can't fucking remember where it was. He was close to. He was close to home, because his he, there was, his brother-in-law lived like three miles away or something. Okay. So he got in the truck and he said something. Let me find it real quick. Oh, he said, if it's already after Travis said this, he said, if it's already after midnight, I must have been unconscious for a couple hours because I only remember about an hour or an hour or an hour and a half inside that thing. 
So then they looked at him weird, like, you weren't gone for an hour and a half. He was like, you were gone for five days. So he was gone for five fucking days. Mm-hmm. And he, like, well, he, like, felt his face and he had, like, a beard and shit. He was, like, um, he was clean shaven when he was abducted. And so, yeah, he was missing for five days. The police originally thought that, like, one of the, because him and one of the other loggers, like, they were, like, arguing and, like, weren't getting along. So he thought the guy killed him. He thought they killed him and, like, made up this story. And they all took lie detector tests. They all passed it. But the police were still suspicious until they found him. So, like, obviously they found him now. They weren't, like, under investigation anymore. And when he was on the Joe Rogan podcast, he was saying, like, at the time he was terrified of the things. They thought they were going to, like, hurt him. But he said after decades of, like, reflecting on it, he said he obviously doesn't know, but he gets the feeling that, like, they weren't he doesn't know if he was supposed to see the thing but he said he thinks that they accidentally hurt him with that beam so they like took him on to like heal him oh okay but yeah no he said now he thinks that they weren't being malicious they were actually trying to help him and he went nuts which like is understandable you wake up in a weird fucking room and there's not humans in there yeah but yeah it was a weird it was a weird fucking story dude that's uh, i like that one it it sounds like kind of real compared to some of the other fucking wackos we see the only thing that made this more believable is they couldn't disprove it yeah like he was gone for five days the men had nothing to do with it because they just saw him get fucking zapped and they went back to the spot and they took like core samples from the trees and on the inside because like it was like in a kind of a ring of trees that this thing was in and all the trees fate like the side of the trees that were facing the craft all had like more radiation in them than the other side of the trees so like it seemed like something was there and like affected the trees mm-hmm. it was, yeah it's a, it's a weird story dude he said he also like i think it was after this he said one night he woke up in his house like he woke up as he was running down the hallway like in his house and he just had he had he had the idea he was like i need to get to my son's room now and he's like so he woke up in a sprint down the hallway and he said his son had rolled through the uh, bunk bed in his room and was hanging by his fucking neck in a bunk bed. So if like, if he wouldn't have been in the room, his son would have died. So he was like, I don't know if like these things had something to do with it. And like, yeah, cause he woke up in a dead sprint. Can you imagine waking up running? <laughs> That'd be insane. Yeah. It's fucking weird. He also saw, he was on his way back from a UFO conference. He was later after this abduction yeah. and him and his son saw this huge black triangle moving through the, st- through the sky like really slowly. So he's seen things before mm-hmm. and he doesn't know if they're all connected. So, yeah, I don't know. It's just he's had some weird experiences. Yeah. And there's something about they figured out, I don't know if it was a CIA guy or something, tried to bribe one of the loggers into like saying like the story's fake. And one of the other guys is like, if you do that, you're gonna have no friends and a broken jaw or something like he was like you already took lie detector tests and everything like don't fuck us right now and make us all look like idiots mm-hmm. so yeah there's a bunch of like weird shit surrounding this story mm. i liked it yeah that's all i have for travis walt yeah i thought that one was pretty believable yeah i don't know i don't know what it would have been like wait how did you explain that and he says he doesn't know if the things were actually humans the humans that were in the craft like your stories like South Park. Remember, they got abducted, and he was like, "You a taco that pooped ice cream." He said, "Yeah." He said he didn't know if they were taking the form that would like comfort him the most because they still never said any words to him. They were just all silent, just like those small things. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I don't know. Weird. Yeah, that's all I got. Oh, well, kind of like switching gears a little bit. Do you want to? Is it like a World War Two story? Uh, I it. it people like historians say it's like one of like the worst battles like with like the worst conditions that like we ever fought in Mm -hmm. i guess it's not we but the allies so like obviously you know that june 6th is Mm d-day and that's like the first time that we really got like a foot in the door in europe so well i'll just say this right now we're switching stories yeah so no it's just so nobody thinks they're connected (laughs) um so the allies start to take important ports and because like obviously if you're gonna have a bunch of guys, guys there I keep looking at the camera uh the where the camera should be 
um, if you have a bunch of guys you gotta like give supplies to them you can't just throw them in with nothing so they start taking all these places like around Normandy and like stuff like places like that and um, the Allies have been pretty successful until Operation Market Garden which was supposed to be carried out by British and American troops uh, but it failed and they lost over 7,000 men to the Germans and uh, Ant Antwerp or Antwerp it was taken by the British before Operation Market Garden was carried out and this was pretty good because they had like it said 45 kilometers worth of docks for ships to pull into so like that's like a huge like port um but they like they couldn't they took the town but they couldn't get to it because like with ships anyway mm. because the Germans still controlled the the Scheldt River that connected to the North Sea so you can't get ships in there so they were trying to get ships through the river yeah. to the port okay um so Antwerp was an important port for the Allies, so it became like the center of their concentration. And uh, the first Canadian army was given the task to get Antwerp, Antwerp, or Warp, yeah, I think Antwerp, Antwerp, yeah, uh, back from the Germans. Uh, and it wasn't just the Canadians; there was actually a lot of people. Uh, they had American, British, Dutch, Polish, and French soldiers. And so Zuid, Beveland, and Walcheren were two islands outside of Antwerp. Antwerp, and uh, I think it was, oh, hell, um, it was like in Belgium or, or something like that, and uh, so these two islands, they were really known for their horrible terrain, because they were below sea level, so like, they'd flood all the time, and, like uh, a swamp. Yeah, so Wol, Wol, Wolcheren, 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 that's it, Wolcheren, uh, it was surrounded by the Scheldt on the north and the south face. So, like, it kind of split, and then I guess just met back up again. But uh, there was 86,000 German troops there, and they had, like, dug in, fortified, and they had, like, guns pretty much just, like, in the ground. So it was going to be, like, a bitch to take this place. Yeah. And, like, they couldn't be bombed with, like, airplanes because they had, like, concrete above them, so they weren't going anywhere. And the Germans had put a lot more troops on Wolkeren after Normandy, uh, in their retreat, and it said that on the Atlantic seawall, this is the highest concentration of German soldiers. Damn. So, like, obviously there's a metric fuckton of soldiers here. <laughs> so, uh, even if they wanted to get in the river, it was, like, almost impossible because they had just, like, loaded up that thing with mines. So you can't take anything, like, you can't, you can't drive through there, like, like, at, like, a shallow spot or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, you can't bring ships up it. Or like little boats so moving troops was difficult because most of the land was below sea level like i said so it's constantly flooding which slowed down the allies and like it's hard to sleep there because you can't like you don't have a, a dry spot and this this started in september so just keep that in mind um so the canadians they were able to get across the shelf into the into breskins uh across a bridge there so they had they were able to move into german territory for the, like the first time and uh, so they made it to Breskins, and that was like one part of like their mission. But they had they were like long from over, so uh, they still had to take Vlissingen at Zuid Bevelin. So this is on the other island now. They take out the one island, but they still have a whole other island to do. So this meant the only way to approach them was by amphibious assault. And again, the Germans are like they are they know that they're coming and that, you know, shit's about to get real. And they were dead set on keeping the island because because they also used it for their own supply lines and they had an, like an airstrip nearby. So if they lost this, it'd be devastating them because they couldn't get supplies through the other troops and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, and they also had an airstrip nearby too. So that's pretty important to have that because like, obviously if you have that on, like in mainland Europe, you're pretty fucked if you lose that. Mm -hmm. um, and that'd be especially good for the Americans, or, or I guess the Allies, too, because that's, like, I, I seriously doubt they got a whole lot of airstrips on D-Day, so that'd be a big score. Yeah. Um, so the Canadians, they had a really rough go of it trying to get Vlissingen back uh, because of the horrible we weather conditions, and the Germans had set up, like, all sorts of booby traps, just a lot of trickery going on, and they are like, taking like, like cheap shots kind of 
and listening in. So they finally got to it, and in one day they were like they finally got to the railroad tracks outside of Lissingen, and that's like where they set up. So it's just like a little town or city, I guess. And they had pictures of it. It looked kind of big. Um, but so they're on the outskirts of this town and they're just kind of stuck there. Um, so in one day they lost 145 men either to uh, like being shot or wounded. And then 27 more were captured by the Germans. And so after that, the Canadians they had to keep fighting and they tried to capture the German forces on the island, like around them to try and cut off their supply lines. So they just start like dying off on the inside of Lissingen. Mm -hmm. And uh, during this time, like British planes were dropping uh, bombs and stuff on them and trying to like, like weed them out. And uh, so they had been also bombing like, uh, like dikes around the area to try and get the place to flood so that um, they could use, like they wanted to get it flooded enough where they could bring in more, uh, more equipment for an amphibious assault to get them just a little bit closer and okay. get them out of like the swampy areas, and so uh, they finally did get they get it, got it flooded enough, um, and so they like were like fighting in the streets like street by street just trying to get this place back, and uh, they finally took it for good on November first, and uh, it, the time came to clean up the German defenses in the area. So they had to go through like the whole river and just clean up all these mines, all these booby traps. And they finally did get like guys into uh, uh, Ant Antwerp. Okay. And so this uh, Antwerp's in what you said? Where did you say? Belgium? It was on that first. I, hang on. Let me look this up. Because um, Antwerp sounds familiar. I can't. I just can't remember where yeah, it's Yeah, it's at. a city in Belgium. Okay. Um. Yeah, so, like, they had this, like, horrible time. And they didn't really go into the conditions a whole lot. Uh, it said that there was, like, soldiers who said that this was, like, one of the worst times of their lives because you had nowhere, like... And it was this was also, like, in the beginning of winter, too. So it, they also had one of, like, the worst winters in a long time. Like so they're getting snowed on, too. Cold. Yeah. So aside from flooding... And watching out for mines, they're also getting snowed on. Mm. So obviously, that, that suck a lot. Um, man, I thought I had that in here, but I must have not put that on here. What the suck a lot part? The the winter. But um, I, I thought this was pretty impressive. Of the eighty six thousand Germans that were there, twelve thousand were killed and forty one thousand were taken for prisoner. Holy shit! Yeah, Did so they just start like surrendering or what? I I guess. That's what fifty three thousand taken out of eighty six. So that's thirty six thousand that were still alive after Jesus. this battle. That actually got away. Yeah, but it's this is like I've never heard of this before. Um, but it was, it's considered like one of the worst, if not the worst, battle of like World War Two, just because of like the horrible conditions. Yeah, and like trying to stay alive. Like the Passchendaele of uh, World War Two. Yeah, that was in World War One, right? Passchendaele. Yeah, yeah. that's. I think that was the one where they bombed the fuck out of it. And, and they just broke, super swampy. Yeah, they broke the irrigation lines or something and just, like, flooded the place. Yeah. Yeah, except like, they're doing this on purpose. Yeah, because they're trying to get, like, boats and shit in. Yeah. So that, it was, like, a seawall type thing? like. Uh, yeah, going like into the city, the way they first went in, I think they went in, like, head on. Bless <laughs> you. Thank you. Um... But I guess they had to like go around another side to get there. But I thought that was kind of creative, like you know, Flooding just yeah, end. just keep expanding like where the water is at. That is pretty smart. Yeah, you say it's on in the Atlantic. It was on the Atlantic seawall. I didn't know Belgium was a coastal. Well, place. well, they got the river there though. So I mean, it's technically still on the Atlantic seawall, but so yeah, like this, so the river is... connects to the Atlantic. Yeah. Is that okay? Well, yeah, it connects to the the North Sea. Oh, oh, okay, okay. But like, nice. if you look at the pictures of this place, this place is enormous. I'm trying to load a map of it, but the map's not loading. I like a little square out of the map, but I see part of it. Part of what I'm guessing is the sea. Say that's called the North Sea. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah, the river comes out of the sea and works its way down into Antwerp. Okay, I see. I see. Oh, wait, 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 wait. 
it's I'm looking it up. God damn it, this thing's not fucking loading. I'm just trying to get a better view of like what Yeah, like get an idea do. of what it would have been like. All I can see is part of a huge body of water and then there's like multiple rivers going in to different parts of Belgium and it's Okay, yeah. Okay, I got an idea of it. Yeah. So the the river actually goes around Germany or Denmark, I'm guessing. Uh, Amsterdam, Amsterdam's in Denmark, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's in like the middle of Denmark. So almost. they had to go pretty much like through Denmark a little bit down into... Oh, wait, no. Amsterdam's in the Netherlands. Oh, is it? Yeah. So they go through like around a little bit of the Netherlands down into Belgium through the river. I guess. Because um, like if you look like Dunkirk is like right next to... Dunkirk's in what, France? Yeah, but it's like it looks like it's literally like right down the road. And Brussels, this is the other place I was talking about that they took. Mm. It's uh, like directly south of where uh, Antwerp was at. Okay. Okay. Oh, it just finally loaded. Like I'm just looking on like a like Google Maps right now. That's what I'm trying. Oh, okay. Okay, I see. So, wait, is oh yeah, okay, Dunkirk's in France. Yeah. It's right across. Okay. So the North Sea is part of the, uh, uh, what's the fucking body of water? Oh, the English Channel. Yeah. So it's like the English Channel connects to the North Sea. Yeah. Okay. I see. I see. Yeah. Like it looks like you could drive that. You could definitely drive to Brussels from probably drive to Dunkirk from Antwerp. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They got roads that connect. Oh, shit. What? My phone is close to the mic. It just threw a fit. I want to see what this is like compared to, like, the U.S. What? How because, big? Like, the distance. Because I know, like, like our, like, Spanish teacher, she told us that, like, driving from, like, France to Spain is, like, us going to New York. Oh, yeah, I guess if it, yeah, they're all, like, small countries. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go from, like, Pittsburgh. You we'll can from... travel throughout Europe, right? Without, like, using a passport and shit? I think so, yeah. Trying to find somewhere that's like relative. Okay, we'll go for like Pittsburgh to Columbus. We'll go to this. So it's like a four hour drive, probably, right? Columbia, Ohio? Yeah. Would you say it's a four hour drive? What? To Pittsburgh Columbus? to Columbus. I don't know. I've never been to Columbus. I think it is. Columbus. Okay, so I need to go up. Oh, shit. I that lost is, my way. That is really cool that they started flying the place to get in closer. It's really smart. Yeah. I'm guessing that they've rebuilt those. I would think so, yeah. Unless they're like, this is the city now. We're a water city. Yeah. It's like Venice. Okay. I feel I have to poop really bad. Yeah, I kind of do too. Okay. All right. I'm almost there. You want to poop together? Wait. Um. There's a town. Oh, yeah. You could easily drive to Belgium. Or not. I'm sorry. My bad. Yeah, you could e easily drive to Brussels. From, from Dunkirk. Oh, from Dunkirk. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. It's not super far. Like, it's probably... It looks maybe a little bit shorter than Pittsburgh to Columbus. So it's less than a day drive. Absolutely, sure. yeah. Sure. And Brussels to Antwerp is even shorter than that. That's like a third of the way to Dunkirk. Yeah. But yeah. I thought that was pretty interesting. It was pretty interesting. Like, I've never heard of it before. Yeah, I've never heard that. They, they flooded the city to get boats and shit in. Yeah. It's, it's smart. So wait, did they come from Brussels into Antwerp? Is that what you said? Um, or did they go from the sea? Well, they had Antwerp first. Oh, okay. So they went they from went the to sea Brussels. to Antwerp and then went down to Brussels. I yeah. See. Okay. And I think they might have had this going on at the same time. The, the way they told it, it was a little confusing. But, uh, hang on, I might put it in here. Did they go by river? Because there's rivers going from Antwerp straight to Brussels. Or do they just go... Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm not... I meant Breskins. Not Brussels? Yeah, that was my bad. Where's Breskins at? I don't know. It's in the Netherlands. So they went up? They went from Antwerp up to the Netherlands? Wait. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, okay. Here. Let me see. 
Oh, so they had to hit, they hit Breskins first? Yeah. Okay. Because Breskins is right on the North Sea. Yeah. Okay. I see. I see now. Mm -hmm. I like your story, Ben. Thank you. I like yours too. Yeah, I I think Thanks. yours are pretty interesting. I, I'm surprised that before the Rogan podcast, I never heard that story. Yeah, there's a, there's a story that I heard that was kind of similar to that, but I don't think it that was it. Was it the Betty and Barney Hill? No. Because we did that story like over a year ago. No, it was on BuzzFeed Unsolved, I'm pretty sure. It was an abduction story. Yeah. He got abducted and went onto the craft? I guess, yeah. Because it had the same thing where like trees were like radiated. Or they had radiation on sure? the side where the thing was, yeah. You sure it wasn't this one? It might have been, but I think maybe it was. I also heard that about, um, oh, fuck, what was it? The Dyatlov Pass. That happened at the oh, yeah. Dyatlov Pass, too. Yeah. They found, like, sides of trees. It's like They started growing, like, way faster than the other side of the tree. Yeah, but Russia is also known for, like, not being very vocal about their nuclear Tests mishaps. Yeah. That's, like, it's, it's pretty... Um, detectable though if they tested a bomb at least yeah yeah i'm just saying if they had some secret project yeah i see dude oh there's some story i forget it was they have no idea what it was but there's this massive explosion up in siberia or something and it like destroyed like acres and acres of trees but they have no idea where the explosion came from recently i don't know it wasn't recently i want to look giant siberia explosion i forget what they called it i'm talking way out of my knowledge right now because i can't remember what it was yeah i don't know everything coming up is from ukraine you want to call it yeah yeah this was a rushed one but yeah. i like the stories i think i i should have researched a little quicker that's my bad g yeah so you want to call it yeah let's do it you want to plug the socials yeah you can follow us on Instagram at Grandma's Room Podcast, Twitter at Room underscore Grandma. You can listen to our podcast on video at Rumble and YouTube at Grandma's Room Podcast. And you can hear us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, all the big boys. Find us, maybe leave us a review. It's supposed to help. We're not sure. So. Yeah. Uh, Spotify playlist. Spotify playlist. I got this. Grandma's Saloon. Grandma's Cranberry Street. Grandma's Blues Club. Grandma's to Opium Den. Grandma's Trap House. Grandma's Guitar Case. Grandma's Clam Jams. Jams. There's one more. Uh, there is. Oh, you. That was seven. That was eight. You said eight. I think so. Uh, maybe I. Maybe I'm just suck at counting. And before we go, uh, just a quick shout out. We went and saw the new Top Gun Maverick last night. Fuck, yeah. It was a great fucking movie. Strongly recommend you go see it. I was kind of, like, um, not suspicious. Hesitant? Like, I didn't think it would be great, because it seems like a lot of, like, the sequels Rebus. to older movies and stuff, they're not good. This was fucking good. I thoroughly enjoyed myself watching it. I was literally on the edge of my seat watching it. It was so fucking good. The, dude, the ending? Yeah. I'm not going to spoil anything. I'm just saying... The ending was pretty good. If you're thinking, like, hey, should I go watch that movie? Fucking watch it. Yeah. I still haven't seen the first Top Gun. I've seen half of it. I almost cried. I was like, fuck, this is good. Mm. <laughs> and there's some assholes behind us. <laughs> yeah, they were laughing through the whole thing. Yeah. At, like, parts that weren't funny. That's the only thing I don't like about theaters, because it happened at the Impractical Jokers movie, too. Those people fucking ruined that Like, movie. obviously, you're supposed to laugh, but they're, like, screaming and shit and, like, talking during the movie. And then people were like, shut the fuck up! And then all their friends started doing it. Yeah, once they were told to be quiet, they started laughing louder. It was, like, these, like, blonde girls, I think. I slapped a kid that night. Yeah. I slapped a child. I forgot. I'm kidding. I didn't slap a kid. No, you didn't. I wanted to slap him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm a bigger man than that. Yeah. I don't want to go to jail for assault. Yeah, that'd be pretty <laughs> shitty. I just knocked my picture loose. Whoa. Okay, you want to end it? Yeah. Any last words, Ben? Uh, thank you for being here, and thank you for listening. Uh, we love you very much. Just one, what's one random thought that's coming in your head right now? Uh, I just yanked out a fuck ton of hairs on my wrist because of my watch.
room. 